actually quite old. Uh, people have been interested in how brains work um, at the level of its deep structure for over a hundred years. It's been clear that the brain is made up of nerve cells that are connected together in, in very complicated patterns. Uh, but uh, the approach of trying to figure out exactly how all the brain cells are connected to each other, a kind of mapping of the entire brains, have, has been really impossible until relatively recently. And now uh, it seems conceivable, at least, that one can get an, a sense of how brains are organized at this deep level by mapping out all the connections between nerve cells. And this is an omics, like genomics is the omics of all the genes that make up the instruction book uh, to make cells and organisms. Uh, the omics of the connections of the brain would be the mapping of all those wires, and that would be connectomics. I think it's been known probably since the invention of microscopes uh, that every organ in the body has uh, unique cell types, and these cells are put together in these motifs that underlie the function of the organs. So for example, in a kidney, uh, there are a bunch of cells that form these tubules called the nephron, and the nephron has a filtering function for the blood to remove toxic waste and other ingredients that come out as urine. And it has taken some time, but thanks to microscopes, it's become pretty clear what cell types make up a nephron and how a nephron works. And frankly, if you understand how a single nephron works, you understand a kidney, despite the fact that a kidney is made up of hundreds of thousands or maybe millions of nephrons, because each one is like every other one. So once you understand one nephron, you understand the whole kidney. In fact, the whole kidney is just, because it is iterating the same structure over and over again, there's nothing very special about one kidney as opposed to the other kidney. For example, you can give your kidney away, one of your kidneys away, and the other kidney will do pretty well for you. And the same is true for liver. Uh, part of your liver does the same thing as another part. There's a little motif known as the portal triad. Once you understand that, basically, it's just that same uh, motif and that same function iterated over and over again, and the same for a lung. The brain, however, is very different, uh, because I, although I could lose a lung and survive, I could lose half my liver. If I take out half of your brain or anyone's brain, you'll notice a difference immediately. And that's because brains are made up of uh, a much more diverse set of cellular organizations. The front of your brain, the frontal cortex, for example, does completely different things than the back of the brain, the occipital cortex. The spinal cord has a completely different role in your body than the cerebral cortex, and the cerebellum has a different role, and a place called the amygdala has a different role. Every single part of the brain has its own unique function, and surprisingly, its own unique cell types and those cells are wired together in unique ways everywhere. So you can't simply understand the whole brain by understanding one little piece. You actually have to understand every little piece, and every little piece is different from every other little piece. There's no other aspect of our body that's like that. There's just nothing like it anywhere else. And this has been a tremendous problem uh, for understanding brains. Not only how normal brains work, but how brains work poorly in cases of brain disease. And I mention this because for most organ systems, most diseases can be traced back to an abnormality in the biochemistry or the structure of the cells that make up some part of the motif. So for most kidney diseases, most lung diseases, most liver diseases, you can trace it back. And the field of pathology is the field where people look at these abnormal organs and see something wrong. The field of neuropathology is, is very useful for things like tumors of the brain. But the neuropathology of schizophrenia, which is 1% of the population, or autism, just a tremendous number of children with this disorder, or the wide range of other psychiatric or behavioral disorders, there is no pathology. 
And so some people think the brains must be normal at the level of the cells. That's not the case. The case is actually we just don't know because no one has ever really looked at enough detail to see what the physical structure of the brain is at those high levels because it just seems an insurmountable amount of complexity. And for many years it has been. But now, thanks to uh, automated technologies of industrializing the looking at tissue, it becomes conceivable for the first time, I think, to imagine really having a cellular substrate of every single part of the nervous system. And that's what connectomics ultimately aims to do. The idea that the brain is made up of nerve cells has a history that began in around 1870, 1873 about, when a very, very talented Italian histologist named Camillo Golgi, he was 30 years old and he was playing around apparently in his kitchen with a bunch of chemicals and he mixed them together in a particular way that allowed brain tissue to be stained in an extremely inefficient way. Now normally you'd think an inefficient stain would be the worst thing in the world, but that was the magic of his stain. And to this day, it's not exactly clear why it works this way, but the Golgi stain, it now has his name, and he got a Nobel Prize for this work, so it was important to, to be sure, uh, was a technique that caused the crystallization of a dark reaction product in a very small subset of nerve cells. But once the dark reaction product started to crystallize, it filled up the entire cell. But the vast majorities of cells were unlabeled. So you could see a brain cell in a sea of unlabeled cells. And so for the first time, you could see the full complexity of these individual brain cells. That discovery in 1873 uh, prompted another remarkable scientist, perhaps the greatest neuroanatomist ever, a man named Ramon E. Cajal, a Spaniard, uh, to start looking at the brain with the Golgi technique. And he was a, a genius of a very unusual type. He was a genius who could see, when he looked at things, he could see more than most people could see. In fact, most people denied that he could possibly have seen what he saw, but he definitely did see it because it has stood the test of time. And what he discovered is that nerve cells uh, have two kinds of processes coming out of the cell body. These little cell bodies, they're sort of football shaped. Some of them are local branches that are called dendrites where the cell receives information. These are like antennas for the cell to collect information. And each cell also has one process that goes potentially very far distances called an axon, which is the output of the cell. And he realized that the axons of nerve cells are touching the dendrites of other nerve cells, talking to those dendrites, sending information into the dendrites that then get to the cell body and then get sent out the cell's axon. So there's a directional circuit where the axons of cells are talking to the dendrites of other cells. Those cells are collecting that information and then sending the information on through their own axon to other dendrites of other cells. And in one fell swoop, he sort of figured out how information flowed through the nervous system. And he was right. It's kind of amazing because he was doing this from fixed material stained in a very sparse way. And that kind of worldview has, has, been, has kind of dominated the way we have thought about brains uh, since the time of his discoveries. And he shared the Nobel Prize with Golgi, actually, uh, for his discoveries with that technique. The strength of that approach was the profound um, insight that the brain is made up of nerve cells that have very peculiar shapes. There's a wide range of them, and they have very particular connection patterns. And the weakness of that approach was, unfortunately, a very small subset of nerve cells were stained. So you couldn't say how many different axons converged on the dendrite of a cell, or how many different target cells a particular axon innervated. And it's only with modern techniques that allow us to see all the cells and all the connections that one can kind of fill in this sparse Golgi-like stain now with a complete rendering of what's going on in the brain. The big problem with a field like uh, this is that there is still a huge chasm between what we know about illnesses 
of behavior, whether they're learning disorders or psychiatric illnesses, and what we know about the structure of the brain. So we don't even, in normal brains, have a good map of how brain cells are arranged relative to each other. So it's not um, surprising, I guess, that we don't yet have any really good ideas at the level of fine circuitry about what is different in the brains for many uh, behavioral disorders and psychiatric diseases. Brains are being mapped extremely well now with tools like functional magnetic resonance imaging or PET scanning. These are remarkable tools and they can non-invasively image entire brains uh, at a resolution of about one cubic millimeter is what each little spot of data is. So the brain is rendered at that resolution. Within one cubic millimeter of brain tissue, we could generate 2,000 terabytes of data, two petabytes of data per cubic millimeter. This is a big data problem because a human brain is about a million cubic millimeters. So that would be about two million thousand terabytes or two million petabytes, which is comparable to the digital content of the world. I mean, it's a big number. So uh, one of the real drawbacks of connectomics is it's a big data problem in an enormous big data. It's even big data under, under represents how big <laughs> this data set is. So that is one of our problems. The other is not just if you have the data, but how do you acquire that much data? We are uh, working with a computer, with a, um, a microscope company. Uh, they are building us the fastest electron microscope uh, ever built. Uh, we will take receipt uh, soon. And uh, it images at about two billion pixels per second, or three terabytes per hour. At that rate, one can do a cubic millimeter in less than a month, as opposed to 50 years. <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a big improvement. But still, to do a human brain with a machine like that would be 50 million months. <laughs> So, or a million months. I mean, it's just, it, it's still very difficult to find tools that go fast. Now, I should say that genomics, when it began, was very, very slow. I mean, people were by hand pipetting little things. And if you calculated the speed at which it would have taken to do a human genome, people would have been estimating centuries. And now a human genome can be done in a, a day or two. And, and I think... Once you know how to do it, you can find ways to parallelize and use ever faster machines. So I don't think this is a fundamental limit forever, but we are just at the very beginnings of this field. So this is still a tremendous problem. And, and until computers were around and digitized data and automated machines that were run by computers, it was not even possible to, cons to contemplate doing this kind of project as it is now possible to at least contemplate. Not sure do, but at least contemplate doing. I am a, um, an optimist, to be sure, and uh, we are pushing as hard as we can uh, to make this field a reality. Uh, between the time we started and now, we've had a speed up of several thousand fold. Um, and uh, when our new microscope comes, that will be another speed up of over 50 fold. And, and these speed ups mean that we are moving in the right direction. We're very hopeful that for small animals, uh, we will have full wiring diagrams at some time soon. A human brain is a harder problem, but there may be reasons why after a while it would get boring just as uh, no one would do a full reconstruction of a kidney because once you understand what the motifs are, there's no need to do more. It's possibly that the human brain at some point, we would understand it well enough that we'd say we don't need to do any more. We've got the picture. That's my hope.